I'm so delighted to be part of this conversation and actually to be learning from what was presented this morning and what my fellow panelists are talking about. Um, you know, we're actually doing some similar work at Kaiser Permanente, and I, I want to tell you first about Maury Collin. He was one of the founders of Kaiser Permanente as an organization. Um, this is Maury in the late 1960s. And he also helped to found the field of medical informatics. Um, so when Maury and his colleague Sidney Garfield were sitting there in the 1950s, Sidney said to Maury, hey, I think computers are someday going to be very useful in the practice of medicine. And Maury, who was an internist and an electrical engineer, went off to Columbia to, um, to learn what they were doing with computers there. He came back inspired. He founded the Division of Research in 1961. Maury was the first director of the Division of Research at Kaiser Permanente Northern California. I am the fifth. So um, our organization has a long tradition of using data for population health. Um, now, we in Northern California are actually just part of a national organization. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our own laboratory. Um, the organization as a whole is an integrated healthcare system, meaning that the health insurer has a monogamous relationship with the medical groups that provide care to patients. We actually um, have seven different regions around the country. We have more than nine million patients nationally. And um, my own region, Northern California, we have three, three and a half million patients. If you think of Kaiser Permanente's nine million patients nationally, we're about the same size as a Scandinavian country. Um, so it's a really rich laboratory for population health, genomics, informatics. Um, we have, in Northern California, 21 hospitals, 8,000 physicians. Um, my own division of research is relatively small compared with the university. We have 50 MD and PhD faculty researchers. We have more than 500 people and about a, an annual budget of about $75 million a year. 80% of that is external, so it comes from NIH, CDC, FDA, um, the same kinds of funders you would find at a Stanford Medical School um, department. The range of our portfolio spans traditional epidemiology and genomics to delivery science. We don't really do bench science. We partner with people who do. Um, so this is actually my boss's boss, Robbie Pearl. He is the executive director of the Permanente Medical Group and actually uh, appointed um, on the Stanford Business School faculty as well. And when I arrived as the director of the Division of Research three years ago, um, Robbie gave me a mandate. And he said, look, we need to be faster and better at using our computerized data to deliver health care. Um, and this is one of the columns that Robbie wrote in Forbes um, a while ago. He writes a weekly column in Forbes, and I, I recommend it if you guys um, like to follow developments in, in current healthcare. Um, but Robbie's point in this column was that if we leave our data in big computers, it does nothing for us. We need to be faster and smarter about getting it from our large systems onto smartphones, onto, um, into places where physicians can use it at the bedside for better decision making, where patients can take advantage of it for healthcare decisions that they're going to make. So, you know, to fulfill the mandate that Robbie has given to my division of research, we need to imagine what is health care going to look like in 10 years, and how will research play a role in that health care? Um, we believe that two large trends, um, which are really central to this conference, informatics and genomics, will combine with the methods we, that we have traditionally used in epidemiology and health services research. We will develop better and better clinical decision support, we will be able to do more and more rapid clinical effectiveness studies. So when David Atkins talked about using the N of millions to inform care for the N of one, that is exactly where we're going. Um, and we, we think that in a population like ours, in an integrated system like ours, we are in an ideal setting to do better personalized medicine. Um, but you know what? It doesn't always work out that way because we struggle sometimes with our own data. We do have very rich, complex data. It comes from many different sources. So the box up on the left is EPIC. Um, that's our real-time uh, electronic medical record. Um, our version of it is called Health Connect. It is copied once a day to Clarity, which is a more static system where we can do research and it doesn't mess up the um, clinical systems. 
But I'll tell you, Clarity has tens of thousands of data tables, and we have dozens of programmer analysts who spend their time just trying to understand what's in those tables. Um, we have many, many other systems. Some of them are legacy systems that have existed since the 1960s. So what we have done in my division of research is we have a strategic programming group. We have more than a dozen um, data architects and programmer analysts, and they, they really just assemble the research database for other research teams to use. Um, the data span from 1960 to the current time. There are more than 14 million patients in this data set. And it has been organized into what we're fond of calling a virtual data warehouse. Um, now, the virtual data warehouse is not solely ours at Kaiser Permanente. This concept was actually originated in many different studies. So the Cancer Research Network, the HMO Research Network, the Vaccine Safety Data Link Project, um, many different groups around the country have um, assembled their data into a virtual data warehouse. It's basically a common data dictionary of the, the kinds of things that you would want if you were phenotyping patients, so diagnoses, procedures, utilization, um, demographics, mortality. Um, some of the virtual data warehouses um, around the country include other data, such as data on healthcare benefits. Um, we are expanding our data warehouse to include cancer data. Um, we are developing pregnancy data tables. Um, and actually, these data link up with all of the 19 other members of the HMO Research Network um, and, and many other sites around the country as well. PCORnet, um, which our first speaker this morning, Sharon Terry, mentioned, is using a similar version of a common data model that looks something like the virtual data warehouse. The FDA has the Sentinel Initiative that has 100 million people um, and, and actually uses a common data model that looks like this. So these systems do cross-talk with one another. Um, now, Locally, here in Northern California, we've cre created tremendous resources for collaboration and genomic research. And about 10 years ago, Kathy Schaefer of my division and Neil Riesch of UCSF initiated the research program on genes, environment, and health. It was initially supported by grants from the Valley Foundation, the Ellison Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and then a few years ago got a $25 million um, stimulus package grant from the National Institute on Aging. And we have now built the research program to include a very large, diverse general population cohort of about 200,000 patients who've donated specimens. 100,000 of those have been genotyped, and they reside in a state-of-the-art biorepository in Berkeley. Um, these specimens form the cornerstone of the Kaiser Permanente Research Bank, which is the national outgrowth of this. It will involve all of the Kaiser Permanente regions and eventually contain a half million members, so 500,000 of our own members, with specimens, survey data, and the phenotyping data that we have from the um, dynamic, real-time electronic medical record. We are planning to follow, of course, our patients longitudinally in this way. Um, we do use our electronic medical record and our phenotyping data to select patients to assemble large cohorts. We have just started a, an autism family biobank that will assemble 5,000 trios of um, patients with autism and their parents. Um, so that's just at the start being funded by a grant from the Simons Foundation. Um, you know, sometimes we fail. And we fail when we identify a problem of interest we make a decision to study it, we assemble the data, we analyze it, we interpret results, and we send them off to journals. And so we fail when we fail to close the loop because we don't want the information that we've produced to just sit within journals. More and more of our work is focusing on closing this loop. So we close the loop when we can develop a tailored message to our physicians, and patients, we can prompt them to take action to change practice. And to do that, we need the kinds of tools that you in this group and the, the speakers in this conference are developing. So we need better and better technology for rapidly aggregating and analyzing data. We, we need better mechanisms for tailoring those messages to our decision makers and on the back end, mechanisms for capturing whether they actually made a change in their practice or not. I want to give you just one example of work that we're doing. Um, this is work by Gabriel Escobar, who's one of our senior scientists, Vinnie Liu, who actually finished a fellowship at Stanford, and we were lucky enough to recruit Vinnie. Um, and it's called advanced alert monitoring. 
So the problem is that if you're a physician or a nurse in a hospital, you want advance notice when your patient is starting to crash and that they're going to be at high risk of needing transfer to the ICU. And ideally, you'd like to make that prediction with 12 hours of lead time, um, not the hour before, because that doesn't give you enough time to intervene. So what Gabriel and Vinny did was to develop a prediction model that uses data on more than 650,000 hospitalizations with 20,000 adverse outcomes, meaning unplanned transfer to the ICU or death on the ward. They, they developed a regression model with age, sex, laboratory score, comorbidity score, and many other variables. But you know, the success of this model is going to depend on human factors, such as whether the physician ignores it. So what they cleverly did was to work carefully with the physicians in our hospital settings, and they, they set a threshold um, to result in one alert per day per 7,000 discharges a year. And the whole goal is to avoid alert fatigue. So the average physician working in the hospital will get an alert about once a week. Um, at this frequency, it has a sensitivity that you would think, oh, that sounds kind of lousy. It's only 25%. Specificity of 98%. But that's actually good, because when you're the physician, you get one alert a week, and you know that it has good specificity. You better do something about that patient. It uses a sidecar strategy, so it gets the data out of our epic um, electronic medical record. It draws from computerized data on other servers and actually processes the data on an external server, so it's much faster. And those results are then sent back into the epic electronic re medical record so that if there's a high-risk patient, when the nurse or physician opens the chart, they see this pop-up. And it says, hey, you know, um, your patient's in trouble. Um, here's the report, and your patient is at high risk. Now, as David Atkins, our last speaker, was observing, it's really important to know what to do afterwards. And I was asking Gabriel and Vinny, hey, what, what do these guys do with it? And um, they do a number of different things to intervene, maybe give a fluid bolus. It's, this has really just been rolled out in two of our 21 hospitals. It looks like it's working pretty well so far. Um, and we're probably going to do what's, um, what we think of as a phased rollout or perhaps a stepped wedge randomization design among all of the hospitals in our region to see whether it really works. So ask me again in a year or two, um, and I'll, I'll have um, the results for you. So you know, to wrap up, a lot of our business is really just taking messy data, trying to convert it into meaningful information. But this last step here, getting it to be applied knowledge that physicians patients and policymakers actually use is, I think, what is our biggest challenge within Kaiser Permanente. Um, we are really transforming the paradigm from research that used to be like figure skating. You know, it would reward precision and solo action um, to trying to be much faster, um, acting in a team, trying to anticipate where that puck and the needs of our patients and providers are going to be. Um, we're really happy to be working where we are. It's an exciting time to be in big data, and we welcome collaboration because our team is small and we need collaborators like you. So thanks very much.